Hello again, Long Branch Baptist Church, and welcome to our YouTube service. And before I get into the sermon, I'm just going to pray for Olga and the volunteers and the clothing outlet. Uh, right now, we are not accepting any donations, but God willing, after COVID-19, we'll be taking the donations. Uh, so please join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for Olga and the volunteers and the clothing outlet, that God willing, that you will end this COVID-19, uh, that you will continue to be with all the volunteers and Olga as well. And we pray, God, that as we get into your word, that you will speak to our hearts, forgive us for our sins, we give you our distractions, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I remember going to Kumon class, which is like a math tutor. When I got to class, I didn't pay attention. The sole purpose of why I was going there was to get better in math. But I was so distracted, I lost focus when I was there. As a believer, sometimes we lose our focus as well. The sole purpose of why we are here is that in whatever we do, we do it all for the glory of God. But sometimes we get distracted by the things of the world and lose focus. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. I'll be preaching from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23 to 33. Paul makes it clear that eating in the temple is idolatry. And in today's passage, Paul now addresses eating meat from a marketplace. And also what happens if you get invited to an unbeliever's home for dinner. Basically, Paul says in verse 25, eat whatever is sold in the marketplace without raising any questions because verse 26 Everything in the earth belongs to God. That's it. It's okay is what Paul is saying. Also, if you get invited to a home of an unbeliever, Paul says in verse 27, eat whatever is put before you without raising any questions. However, in verse 28, Paul says, if the person tells you that the meat was sacrificed, don't eat it. Why? Because of their conscience and not yours. You are free to eat, but if a weak believer sees that, they may stumble. Therefore, Paul says in verse 31 to 33, he will not do anything to cause people to stumble. So again, we don't generally face this on a day-to-day -day basis. Buying meat that came from the, from the pagan temples that were sacrificed to idols or eating meat at a person's home where it was also sacrificed to an idol. Generally speaking, we don't face this. Basically, what Paul was getting at was whatever you do, including eating and drinking, do it all for the glory of God. Firstly, we seek the glory of God by not just doing whatever we want, verse 23. We seek, secondly, we seek the glory of God by seeking the good of others, verse 24 to 30. Thirdly, we seek the glory of God by doing whatever, by doing everything for the sake of the gospel, verse 31 to 33. So again, that's what I wanted to share with you today. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Firstly, we seek the glory of God by not just doing whatever we want. Verse 23, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. So again, this was a common saying in Corinth. I have the right to do anything. Pretty much, I can do whatever I want without any limits. And this mentality of the culture started to seep into the church. In Corinth, I can do whatever I want. I can even sin because I'm saved. And that's why we have that case of the man who committed sexual relations with his stepmother. That is not honoring to God. That is not how we seek the glory of God, by just doing whatever we want. There is a danger when the world's culture starts to infiltrate the church and corrupts the gospel. And that is what was happening in Corinth but it's also happening in our day as well in the churches around the world. There's a lot of churches in the States where their mentality is the bigger the better. It's all about numbers. Well, that sounds very much like the culture in our society where the focus is on the outward appearance of things. So when the sinful things of the culture start to infiltrate a church, well, that's dangerous. So again, this mentality of I can do whatever I want because I'm saved is not beneficial to the believer in many ways. When you see that word beneficial, the ESV uses the word helpful. The New American Standard Bible uses the word profitable. So basically, not everything is beneficial, helpful, profitable to your relationship with Christ. Also, you see the word constructive. The ESV uses the phrase, not all things build up. The, N the New American Standard Bible uses the word edify. So basically, not everything is constructive, builds up, or edifies your faith. 
You can also apply this not just to our individual faith, but also to the church as a whole. You can say not everything is beneficial, helpful, profitable, constructive, builds up and edifies the church of God. So the Corinthians were saying, I can do whatever I want, and that includes having sexual relations with my stepmother, to eating in the pagan temple. And Paul says, you are wrong, because not everything is helpful to your relationship with God. And not everything builds up the church. Verse 23, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. So if you wanna seek the glory of God, do the things that are profitable to your faith and what edifies the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. Everything must be done so that church may be built up. The New American Standard Bible says, let everything be done for edification. So if what you are doing is not beneficial or constructive to your faith, like going to the pagan temples for the Corinthians, and if what you're doing is not beneficial and edifying to the church, then don't do it. By doing whatever you want at the cost of your brother and sister in Christ stumbling is not glorifying to God. In our day, people say, God can't tell me what to do. I'll do whatever I want, when I want. Even as believers, sometimes we have that attitude towards God, I'll do whatever I want. Even if I cause someone to stumble, who cares? Well, that's not honoring to God at all. So this is not a selfish thing where I only do things to benefit me. That's not what Paul is talking about here. It is what is helpful to my faith and the body of Christ. These things I will do. Understanding that the judgment of God and the wrath of God is coming because of sin. Colossians chapter 3 verse 5 to 9 says, Put to death the things that belong to the earthly nature, sexual immorality, lust, evil desires, greed, idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in those ways in the life you once lived, but now rid yourself of these things. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language. Stop lying to each other. So it's clear in, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 to 9, it says, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. So we are humbled by the fact that we are all under the wrath of God, that we are all sinners deserving of an eternity of hell. We are not better than anyone, but we have hope that Jesus died for us while we were enemies of the cross, so that when we confess our sins, repent, and put our trust in Christ, we will be saved from hell and spend an eternity in heaven. There is judgment and there is wrath. But there is also forgiveness, love, mercy, and grace at the cross. Understanding that true repentance means to turn away and hate our sins. And that grace is not a license to sin. We're not perfect and will make mistakes. But empowered by the Holy Spirit, we are called to obey Christ. Remembering that it is a free gift of salvation, something that we cannot earn or work for. And this humbles us each day, but also gives us hope every day. And this hope in Christ motivates us to live for the glory of God in whatever we do. The grace of God helps us not just to do whatever we want, but to live for what glorifies God. In 1898, they used to give heroin to kids. It was advertised and proclaimed as a safe medicine to cure sore throats, coughs, and colds. Eleven years later, in 1913, heroin was banned completely because it became clear how dangerous the drug is. It has side effects. It's highly addicting. And at one time, it was proclaimed and advertised as a safe drug to cure kids' coughs, but it was eventually made clear it is not safe and beneficial for kids. Now, it's absolutely clear from Scripture that sin is not safe and beneficial to our faith or to the church, but is actually dangerous. Some people may proclaim and advertise that sin is profitable and edifying for you in the church, but Scripture makes clear that is not the case. So in Corinth, that's what they were saying. That's what they were doing. They were proclaiming and advertising that sin is okay, that you have the right to do anything. Verse 23, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. But Paul makes it clear in 1 Corinthians, sin is not profitable, not edifying, and does not glorify God. Therefore, flee idolatry, flee sin, and turn to Christ. 
So what is beneficial to our faith? Reading the word daily, meditating on it, praying without ceasing, fellowship, for us at least joining the Zoom calls on Tuesday. And we don't do these things like a robot or just out of empty routine. We do these things because we are in a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and we love Him and want to spend time with Him. We don't do these things to get salvation, but we do these things because we have salvation, not trying to earn brownie points with God. What else is beneficial to our faith is discipline. When God disciplines us, this is for our benefit, for our sanctification and edification. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3 to 11, it says God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in His holiness. For the moment it may seem painful and is not pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. We don't run away from God's discipline, but we humble ourselves under His hand so that we may grow in our faith and be built up. Michelangelo was one of the greatest artists of our time. He was a sculptor, a painter, an architect, and poet. He is famous for his masterpiece, David, a 14 feet statue of King David made out of marble. It is one of the most famous pieces of art in history. It was started in 1464 by another artist who abandoned the work. In 1475, another artist started it but abandoned it again. Finally, Michelangelo started it in 1501 and finished it in 1504. So from start to finish, it took 40 years for this masterpiece to finally get done, Michelangelo is said to have worked in the rain, slept in his clothes and boots, ate very little in order to finish it. If you look at the statue and you look at the hands, you look at the veins, it almost looks real. It really is a masterpiece that was completed by a talented artist. It wasn't completed overnight. It took time and care in the same way, sanctification and God maturing us and growing us. It's not an overnight thing. It takes time and patience. God will be working through us and in us, not just for 40 years, but for the rest of our lives. God uses the trials and temptations and hardships and discipline, joys and comfort and everything for our growth and sanctification. As long as we are alive, God has not finished molding us into the image of Christ. So when people look at the statue of David, they don't praise the statue. They praise the artist, Michelangelo. In the same way, when people see our lives and how much God is transforming us from a rough piece of stone to a mature believer, God gets the glory and not us. For there is nothing great about us. It is about the great creator and the potter that gets the glory. Matthew chapter 5 verse 16 says in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify God. It's not about glorifying ourselves, but it's through our good deeds that people will glorify God. And whatever we do, we do for the glory of God. So we don't run away from God's discipline because that is beneficial to our faith. Another question is, what is beneficial to the building up of the church, the body of Christ. So what is not beneficial to the edifying of the church is gossip, slander, division, and unrepentant sin. So obviously there are hills to die on, for example. If the gospel is being twisted to the point where it denies that Jesus is God, then that has to be addressed. If there is a group in the church that's teaching that Jesus is not the only way to the Father, it's probably time to end, time to end ways with that group. So I'm not talking about a superficial unity, a unity for the sake of unity that turns a blind eye to sin, but unity within true believers centered around Christ. So in that case, division is not beneficial to the church, but we cannot turn a blind eye to sin. So we seek the glory of God by not just doing whatever we want, but by doing only the things that are helpful to our faith and constructive to the body of Christ. Secondly, we seek the glory of God 
by seeking the good of others, verse 24 to 30. So we don't just seek our own good or do whatever we want because that is not honoring and glorifying to God. What gives glory to God is to seek the good of others, verse 24. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. In this context, again, the Corinthians are so focused on their freedom, they cause others to stumble. So Paul is saying that's not glorifying to God. The end goal of the Christian life is not just freedom to do whatever you want. It is to love God with all of your heart, your soul, and your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And we do this not in our own strength, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. In our own strength, we will fall. That is why we need the Holy Spirit. So the Corinthians were selfish, consumed with their own needs in our society, especially in North America. It is all about the individual, my property, my this and my that, everything in the box to the left, please don't touch. So even us believers can become so consumed with just our bubble that we forget the body of Christ is a community. And not just about Long Branch, which we definitely don't want to forget about, but remembering the body of Christ is around the world. Verse 24, no one should seek their own good, but the good of others. So us believers, we don't just seek our own good. We seek the good of others because we are a community of faith. There is a town in the U.S. which has a population of one person. It is called Manawi, the town of Manawi. The one person that lives in that town is also the mayor, the librarian, and official bartender. So when, the, when she applies for her liquor license, she has to apply to herself and approve it herself because she's the only one in town. She even pays taxes to herself. She even has elections for mayor and she votes for herself and she wins because there's no one else to run for mayor. There are three housing units. Only one is occupied. There are four street lights. There's even a church. So evangelism in that town might be a little easier. Can you imagine living in a town by yourself? As a believer, we are not an island of one or a town of one, but we are a community of Christ followers that seek the good of our brothers and sisters in Christ. So we know it's hard right now because of COVID-19. We can't meet, but we can at least meet on Zoom on Tuesdays. We can call people. We can visit at a distance. When we think of the underground church right now around the world, in some places, if you get caught meeting in a community of believers, you will get killed. They can't even have Zoom meetings or calls just in case someone is listening. God willing, this will end soon so we can meet as usual, but even in the midst of of COVID, God is working. The underground church can't meet, yet God is working in those places. Sometimes God uses persecution and trials to spread the gospel even further, showing that nothing completely can kill off the gospel. Again, God is in control. We are thankful for at least Zoom, call, Zoom calls on Tuesday. I want to encourage you to take advantage of this and join us every Tuesday for now because God has given us this opportunity to encourage one another. That is how we can glorify God and seek the good of others. If you have prayer requests, feel free to contact me or Pastor Ra, Pastor Emmanuel, Olga, or even the elders if you need. We are here for you. I want to give another challenge to you guys. Read the directory. And every time you see a contact without an email, it might mean they don't have internet at all, which means they're not getting the sermons, they're not listening to the songs or even the service. We know God feeds us with the word, encourages us with the songs. So there might be some in our church, they're missing out completely. I want to challenge and encourage you to join us in calling those people weekly, encouraging them with prayer that God is there. Maybe even dropping by their houses at a distance to drop off coffee and other things. That is one way for now, at least during COVID-19, we could seek the good of others. Verse 25, eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. So again, Paul reminds the Corinthians they should not eat in the temple or do anything that will cause people to stumble and that they should seek the good of others. In verse 25, Paul wants to make sure they continue to seek the good of others. But, they, but make sure that they do not turn that into legalism. Legalism in the sense of you can't eat that. You can't drink that. Paul says you are free. 
Obviously, we still take care of our bodies because our bodies belong to God, but we don't do this in a legalistic way to earn our salvation. That's why Paul says in verse 25, eat anything sold in the market without raising questions of conscience. It's okay, eat it. And why does Paul say that? Because of verse 26, because the, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Paul says you can eat the meat in the marketplace because everything belongs to God. Psalms chapter 50 verse 9 to 11 says, I have no need of bull from your stall. Every animal of the forest is mine. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. Every bird and every insect is, is mine. It says in Psalms chapter 50 verse 9 to 11 that God owns every animal. Verse 26, verse 25 to verse 26, eat anything sold in the marketplace without raising questions of conscience because, verse 26, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Verse 27, if an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. So again, you don't want to cause anyone to stumble, so you stay out of the pagan temples. You don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. However, if you get invited to an unbeliever's house, Paul says in verse 27, if an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. Eat it. That's what Paul is saying. You don't want to offend the host. Also, Paul is not saying that you can't have any contact with the outside world. Because God can use that relationship and those dinners to win that person to Christ. Obviously, if you're joining in with their sin and being led astray, it's probably wisest to stay away. However, in verse 28, it says, If someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. So if the person tells you it was sacrificed to an idol, Paul says, don't eat it. Not for your conscience, because you know everything belongs to God, but for their conscience. If a weak believer sees you eating meat that is known to be sacrificed to an idol, then, that, then their conscience is destroyed. And you are no longer, you're, you're no longer glorifying God. And you are no longer seeking the good of others. Verse 29. I'm referring to the other person's conscience, not yours. For why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? So Paul is clear. There is only one God. God the Father. God the Son. And God the Holy Spirit. Jesus truly suffered for us. So you are free to eat. However, if it causes someone to stumble, then Paul will never eat meat again. So he's still free to eat. But out of love, concern, and for the other's conscience, he will never meet, eat meat ever again. Verse 29, I'm referring to the other person's conscience, not yours. For why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? Paul makes it clear, though, in verse 31 and 33, that he will not do anything to cause someone to stumble. So he's still free to eat, but he's not seeking his own good. He's seeking the good of others. And that is how we glorify God, by seeking the good of others above ourselves even above our freedom. It's not, I can do this because I'm free, but it's more like, if I do this, will it cause somebody to stumble? Verse 30, if I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? Paul again is saying he is free to eat. Verse 30, if I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? However, he makes it clear again in verse 31 to 33. He will set aside his Christian liberty and freedom so that no one stumbles. It's hard to be thankful for something we do if we know it is causing someone to fall into sin. And Paul makes that clear in verse 31 to 33. Thirdly, we seek the glory of God by doing everything for the sake of the gospel. Verse 31 to 33. Paul's end goal was to reach people for Christ. And if that meant him setting aside his freedom to eat certain foods, then he would do that, whatever, do whatever it took to win people to Christ. Verse 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So that's the end goal of the Christian life, to glorify God. So if what you are eating or drinking is causing people to sin, and that's not glorifying to God. Verse 31, for whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So we live our lives remembering that in all that we do, we do it for Him. Matthew chapter 24, verse 37 to 39, it says, In the days of Noah, so it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. In the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Up to the day of Noah entered the ark. 
Then the flood came and took all of them away, and that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So people must have thought Noah was crazy, right? Why are you building an ark? The end of the world is coming. Where is it? They would have scoffed, just like in our day. But us believers, we look crazy. People mock us and say, hey, where's the end of the world? I'm just going to drink and party. Who cares what happens? There's nothing wrong with marriage, but the point Christ was making was the people were so distracted by the things of the world, just like in the days of Noah when the flood came. People will not be ready. So we as believers, we live each day for the glory of God, whether we eat, whether we drink, it is for His honor. However, we don't get distracted by those things. That is why we must stay in the Word and in prayer daily without ceasing because we must daily be on guard. William Tyndale was an English scholar who translated the Bible into English. And at that time, it was illegal to do that and he was actually executed. And at one time in history, you couldn't own your own Bible. You couldn't read the Bible. Only some people had access to the Bible. And it's interesting at that time that there was such a hunger for people to get a copy of the Word and to read it themselves compared to today where we have complete access to the Word in our, in our society, yet we do not read it. Instead, we are distracted by the things of the world, eating and drinking, social media and things like that. There's a website called Bible Gateway, and you can access right now up to 60 different versions of the English Bible. It even has different languages, German, Spanish, French, Hindi, Korean, Punjabi, Russian, Ukrainian, Chinese, and many more. But we take this for granted. There's no more excuse in why we don't read the Word. The only answer is that we don't want to. Think about at one time only a handful of people had access to the Bible. And now we have access to 60 English versions at a touch of a button. Yet we do not spend time in the Word. If we can spend time on Facebook and Instagram, we can spend time in the Word. I challenge you to count the hours which your smartphone should be able to tell you in, the, in your settings how much time you spend online. Then take some of that time and read the Word of God. The random video of that cat skateboarding can wait. Time is short, so use it to glorify God and to share the gospel. Paul's heart was all about the gospel. The way he glorified God was to do everything, whether he ate or drank, for the sake of the gospel. Verse 32, do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. Living in sin will cause people to stumble. Therefore, repent of your sins. We know sin is dangerous, that the wages of sin is death. There's a mineral called cinnabar, also known as mercury sulfide. It's the most toxic mineral to mankind. When oxidized, the compounds produced can cause terminal damage to the nervous system. There is something more toxic than that to human beings, and that is sin. It is because of our sin we are doomed, yet there is hope in Jesus, and we are humbled by that. If you're listening to this and you've never put your trust in Christ, I want to encourage you to repent and trust in Him. The Bible tells us that we are all sinners deserving of hell. But when we put our trust in Christ, that He died on the cross for us, taking the penalty for our sins, we will spend an eternity in heaven. The Bible tells us Jesus rose from the grave, conquering sin and death. And for the believer in Christ, continue to repent of your sins. We sin every day. We are secure in Christ forever, but we can still fall into sin. See if there is anything you are doing that is causing people to stumble. And if there are things, and those things are not glorifying to God. And we are called in whatever we do, do it for the sake of the gospel and, in, and do it to glorify God. If we cause people to stumble, then how can we lead them to Christ? It would be counterproductive to the gospel mission. Remembering that Christ did not just take the penalty for our sins, but He broke the power of, sin, power of sin in our daily lives that we may live for Him. We will make mistakes, but we do not dive headfirst into sin. Grace is not a license to do whatever we want. So Paul's heart was the gospel, 
and seeing people saved. He will not do anything that will hinder that. So he says in verse 32, do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, verse 33, even as I try to please everyone in every way, I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. He's not saying he's a people pleaser or a spiritual coward just trying to please man. He's saying in whatever he does, it is to see people saved and that that way he gives glory to God. Verse 33, even as I try to please everyone in every way, I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many so that they may be saved. That was his goal in his life, to glorify God by seeing people get saved. Paul says, I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many. He cared about their souls and where they would spend eternity. He was not concerned with his own comfort. In ancient Egypt, some pharaohs, pharaohs, they would cover their servants around them in honey so that all the flies would stay away from him and go to the servants. That's pretty selfish. Can you imagine pouring honey on your kids or wife or husband so that you don't get bit by the bugs? You're seeking your own good, putting yourself first and your family second. Paul says, says in verse 33, I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many so that they may be saved all for the sake of the gospel and all for the glory of God in summary and in closing whatever you do do it all for the glory of God firstly we seek the glory of God by not just doing whatever we want verse 23 secondly we seek the glory of God by seeking the good of others verse 24 to 30 thirdly we seek the glory of God by doing everything for the sake of of the gospel verse 31 to 33 we do this because we were separated because of our sin reconciled by the blood remembering that God sent his son for us Jesus lived a perfect life and because of that we are made righteous as we repent and put our trust in him remembering that it's Christ's righteousness and not ours that the gospel is even for the mature believer every day remembering that this is the only thing that can save us and help us persevere in the power of the Holy Spirit Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God the Father. He is the ruler of the universe and he is returning. And because of this, empowered by the Holy Spirit, in whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God because we deserved hell, yet God had mercy on us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We give you glory, we give you praise. And in all that we do, let us do it for your glory. Help us not to just do whatever we want to do and help us to seek the good of others and help us to, to do everything for the sake of the gospel. And in doing that, we glorify your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So praise God and let us continue to walk with Christ, turn away from sin, and uh, let us continue to encourage each other. God bless.